Um, I used to think fiber optics were really difficult. And what I've discovered is, you know, it's a skill set like anything else. And, but there are some rules. There are some rules to uh, performing it. And we're going to go over those. So we don't break, um, so we don't break the scopes. Uh, I just want to go over some basic housekeeping of how we're going to use this. And by the way, our Stortz folks here have a cleaning station at the center. And they go through this series of Tristel wipes. And so after the scopes get used, uh, they get uh, cleaned in that process. Let me just pop this guy up. And um, so these are video scopes, uh, by which I mean they're not glass fibers going up to a condensing lens that we have a spinning, rotating camera on. These are CMOS chip on a stick. There's an articulating lever that moves the scope up and down. And there's obviously an LED light. And then the image gets transmitted up to the monitor. It's important to know which way is up. So one of the first things when you pick up the scope is you'll notice that I can be like this, and I can go down, and that's getting to one end of my hand, and I can go up. But if you don't know which way you're going, that's a big deal. So, uh, and you can hold the scope the other way, and then forward takes you in a different direction. And so orientation is very important, and there are pluses and minuses to a lever up approach, where your finger's on the top of the scope, and you push it forward, versus a lever down. Honestly, these scopes are so light, it almost doesn't matter. But I find in traditional old fiber scopes, I prefer lever up. But then you have to just know which way your orientation is when you have cameras that are spinning around. But we'll go over that as we set up. Um, don't flick these lenses against the tabletops because they can break. Don't articulate scopes inside of tracheal tubes because the levers are not made to maneuver a tracheal tube. So you, if you were to do long scope intubation, and we have a long scope here, the difference being 30 centimeters on the left, 60 on the right. But if you're doing a long scope intubation, you never articulate the scope inside the tracheal tube. You drive ahead of the, the tube, and then the tube always follows. Um, whenever you take the scope out, have your finger off the lever, because the last thing you want to do is pull through, uh, you know, pull the scope back through the nasal pharynx with the lever down. So um, I, you know, working like this, uh, discovered that fiber optics were not that complicated, but it did take me a little while. Um, and I practiced on myself. Um, it might be a little crazy, but when I was in med school, I practiced putting 12 uh, gauge IVs into myself. And when I got married and I asked my wife if I could practice on her, she said, uh, no. Um, but, uh, and I, but I have scoped my son. Uh, but so I used to think fiber optics were really complicated, but there are just some rules. You know, with laryngoscopes, we separate and divide. If you don't know where you are, you advance. With a fiber scope, when in doubt, pull it out. You have to follow the open channel. You have to understand the anatomy. The anatomy is we have septum here. We have turbinates like this, inferior, middle, and superior. So I'm going to go into my right nair, and I know that this is down, and that's down, and this is up. And you've got those hairs, too. And as you get older, they do get worse. But, uh, and that's why you need, by the way, one of those little Panasonic doohickeys so you can keep that trim, you know? So all right, so we have here uh, on the right side, and the real trick to scoping yourself is operating the laser pointer while scoping yourself. So we have here the inferior nasal turbinate. Here, here's the inferior nasal turbinate. Here's the septum. So this is lateral. This is medial, and this guy is very sensitive and will bleed, and people go, ow, when you hit it. So you don't want to hit it. But I'm going to go alongside the inferior turbinate to get to the back end of my nasal pharynx and introduce you to my eustachian tube coming in from the side here. I don't want to hit this guy. That could bleed. Um, and I come off the, the palate, and actually, uh, Georgie, uh, Dr. Harris, our ENT, my ENT colleague here was just telling me that if you flick the scope, you can actually get to the other eustachian tube. Ah, look at that. I've never seen that. Thank you very much for that one, Georgie. So, uh, all right, so here we are in Pink Mush, and I grew up in New York City, and I would call this schmutz. And how do you deal with schmutz when you get this buildup? What I found works the best is simply going <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, off the nasopharynx and south. Don't want to hit the posterior palate. The uvula. The vollecula. The epiglottis. The posterior cartilages, also known as the arytenoids. The tubercle of the epiglottis, I once called an ENT consult because I thought this was a tumor. Scooby-Doo. That's not a tumor. The piriform sinuses, something I call the trumpet maneuver. The true chords, e the false chords. E I'm going to try to burp for you. Yeah, a little bit of sour taste there, but that's the esophagus north. So we are ENT worldview apex down, the A of larynx pointing anterior. So apex down. When I come out, I leave my finger off the lever. And then we're going to clean the scopes. <laughs> no, 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 no. You can pull the scope out, you can give it to the Stortz folks, and they will clean it. But uh, I just do that for your amusement. Um, some other rules. When you stabilize the scope, you don't want to be in space going like this to the patient. You, I put my fourth and fifth digits on their face, and this is feeding the scope in. This is pivoting. And depending on which way the lever goes, and pick up the scope and look. When you look down the long axis and you're holding the scope, if you put the lever forward and you turn right, it is going left. When you put the lever up and you turn right, the lever goes to your right. And one of the things I do, and I don't have a term for this, but I need a sticky term, and maybe Georgie and I can come up with it. But I do this little just jiggle, I call it. It's just a little like back and forth. So as I'm going through, I'm trying to keep the opening in the center. And I just kind of do these little micro little movements just to see as I pivot which way is which, because it's sort of, I don't memorize in my head, oh, down is, you know, the reverse. I just kind of go like this and I keep following the dark, you know, in Star Wars, follow the dark side, but you want to follow, keep the hole at the center of the screen. Um, but uh, let's see, what other things can we tell you about this before we begin? Uh, oh, uh, topical anesthetic, I'm not a big fan. I used to use uh, a tried cocaine and it works very well, but if you're giving 30, 40 airway courses a year and you're traveling around the world, that's a little, you know, you might have an issue. So I decided uh, no on that. Actually, I think it is far and away the best thing to play in the nose with. Do you use a lot of cocaine? Well, it's in surgery. It's unbelievably good stuff if you, you know, for these terrible nosebleeds and stuff. But, uh, you know, most hospitals I actually work at don't have it. In the States, there's so, so much substance abuse issues that all the hospitals have gotten rid of it. But I use oxymetazolone and 4% lidocaine, but we have coco, what do you call it? Co Cofenalcaine. Co uh, you can try it, but it's bitter. Um, but uh, any other comments, Georgie, for the group before we? No, I think the only um, a few other things I wanted to mention is sometimes um, you get a bit of misting on the end of the scopes. Um, so one of the things I would do sometimes is um, just to get the patients to open their mouth, put the put the tip of the scope on the on the uh, on the tongue, um, and then you just got to remind them that you're actually going through the nose because they also you know keep their mouth open as you're trying to sort of advance the scope. Um, so that helps with the humidification issue. Um, I, I agree with Rich. I think the the things to look out for in the nose are the uh, inferior turbinate. I actually sometimes think that actually the septum is the, is the worst one though because a lot of people, about 80% of people actually have some sort of septal abnormality whether it's a septal spur, septal bowing, whatever and that's the one I think that actually people really hate. So I actually sort of try and keep actually sort of down underneath and follow the floor of the nasal cavity. So you've always got that on view as you're sort of advancing forward. Um, we, we get it, you know, we've got other things in the nose that we get interested in, so we sort of tend to sort of try and get up. But basically, for, for, the, for, for the purposes of today, I think just sort of follow that nasal floor forward. Uh, and then when you get to the soft palate, you can actually sometimes you get, can get a bit lost there. If you get them to breathe through their nose, that often sort of drops their sort of um, drops the palate, and they can actually sort of really really opens up, and then you just sort of, sort of manipulate the lever and advance forward, so you can sort of get around that corner of the nasal pharynx, and you can sort of see the epiglottis and, and the vocal cords nicely. 
Yeah, and actually what defeats us is the patient has a tendency to do a couple of things. They pull back if they're getting irritated. Then what they're doing is they're decreasing their space in the back of their throat. So when they go, that's very bad for that point where you're coming out of the soft palate wanting to go south. So instead, you know, bring their head forward, have them open their mouth. Uh, and then we were chatting and Georgie's suggestion is to have them say one, two, three, so you can see the chords move. Um, some people do a glide where you go and you can see the chord length move. But uh, I think verbalization, you want to just definitely look at that epiglottis edge, vocal cord movement. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm going to hand this off to the Stortz people. So I leave it up to you if you want to do the anesthetic. The upside is it's going to shrink some mucosal tissue. The downside is it's a bit bitter. It also needs five or ten minutes to work. Um, but uh, I tend not to do any. Uh, after you're done scoping, the, after you've done using the scope, we want you to bring the scope to the central table. The storage folks are going to clean it. And then lastly, if we have time, we can show you a little bit going through the nose and going through the mouth. I think the world of fiber optics is going to belong in the future to emergency medicine, or I think it should for a number of reasons. But one of the things that's changing is technology. So this is a single use roughly $200 cost of a central line, long fiber scope. And uh, CMOS, charged metal oxide sensors, these inexpensive camera chips that are in our phones with LED lights, this is the technology that uh, you know, now has a 16 meg camera in your pocket. And uh, I think the future, we're gonna see a lot more inexpensive issues. When you work with a big long scope, this has to get wire brushed and flushed. There's a working channel. Uh, uh, wire brush and flush has to go through the whole thing. So cleaning of a working scope with a full channel is kind of a big deal and an expensive prospect. We are using short rhino laryngoscopes, so if you hold that up, notice that this is 30 centimeters, this is 60. It takes a lot more skill to work out to length here. But as a general principle, you want that scope straight. You don't want this, because if you go like this, you then can't articulate the distal tip. When you're out, you transmit movement much better. So when we're doing this intubation, I call it Statue of Liberty. You know, you have to keep your arm up when you're scoping somebody with a long scope. But even with these short ones, keep it straight back. One last comment on ergonomics. Can I take your seat for a second? Um, and Ash here is, if he were the scopee and I am the scoper, we would have to be a little bit intimate because you're working at 30 centimeters, you're gonna to wanna to put your hand, Vulcan mind meld, your hand on his face. And you have to be somewhat close. I think one of the things I admire most about ENT surgeons is there are surgeons who actually have to talk and interact with their patients. Many surgeons don't, but ENT, if you don't have that patient's trust, everything collapses. And um, so the way that I build up that trust when I'm about to scope somebody is I explain to them, listen, I'm not gonna put anything behind your head. I want you to sit on the edge of the bed. You're gonna lean forward. It's a little irritating to your nose. It might trigger a sneeze. Um, it doesn't really hurt. It tickles a little. And I know that because I do this on myself. And then they go, you've done this on yourself, doc? And I go, all the time. And they go, really? But I think that if they know that you know, I'm not forcing it on them. I'm like, listen, if it bothers you much, we can either pull out, we can sp spray something on into your nose, or alternatively, you know, we don't need to do this. Like, I, I explained to them, I, I would like to see your larynx, this is why, and this takes all of two seconds. And then the other thing I, I also remind them is that the whole scope doesn't go in. The distance you need to get around the curve and look down at their larynx is tiny. Uh, and it's the first part, it's that inferior turbinate that is the hurdle to clear in my experience, or the septum. But, uh, so there's a whole lot of communication issues, uh, but you have to obviously transmit that confidence to your patient. But I never put anything behind their head. And then my hand's on there, and it, I, I see what, how they go, and if they're you know, really backing up, I get ahead of that and say, you know, you're having an issue with this, do you want me to spray you? Or I stop, when, the moment I bang into any kind of issue, like I get the sense that they're not tolerating it, I don't go, I, I stop. 
And just as a general rule of thumb, if you're looking at landmarks and you don't recognize anything, when in doubt, back it out. Get back into the open space. Keep the dark at the center. So uh, let's have a go. and. Uh